In the French Chamber of Deputies this afternoon, Monsieur Dallager reviewed the history of the last-minute diplomatic attempts to avert hostilities. He began by paying a tribute to the efforts of the Italian government and went on to say that Poland was assured of help from the nations of free men. For several days, went on Monsieur Dallager, peace has been menaced by the arbitrary demands of Germany. All peaceful means were utilized in order to save the peace of the world. Germany has reduced them to nothing. Monsieur Dallager said that France and Britain would not stand by at the destruction of friendly people. It was not a question of German-Polish conflict, he said, but of a new attempt to dominate Europe. Monsieur Dallager recalled the fate of Austria and Czechoslovakia and said that with Herr Hitler, it was deeds and not words that counted. France had always emphasized that she would fulfill her pledges towards Poland in the case of aggression, and Poland had suffered the most unjust and brutal aggression. A France which would allow such aggression to be carried out would soon be discredited and exposed to the most formidable of onslaughts. Monsieur Dallager then recalled the joint démarche made by the British and French ambassadors in Berlin and repeated that France would unhesitatingly fulfill her obligations unless the attack on Poland stopped. President Lebrun has sent a message to the French Senate and Chamber. He says that war has broken out because the two nations had differences which could have been settled by free and loyal negotiations. But at the moment when their plenipotentiaries were about to meet, Germany attacked Poland. Great Britain and France, says President Lebrun, have done everything humanly possible to avert this crisis. The evacuation of civilians in Paris is going on steadily and special trains have been leaving for the country all today. The French cabinet met at 7.30 tonight under the presidency of Monsieur Dallager. Before the meeting, Monsieur Dallager had a talk with the foreign minister, Monsieur Bonnet, and the supreme commander of the armed forces, General Gamma. This is London calling in the overseas service of the BBC. And now we continue the news summary. According to an official Polish telegram, Warsaw has been bombed six times today. The telegram adds that fighting of a most serious nature continues on the whole length of the front. An official German communique issued at midday claims that German troops advanced at all points early this morning. It was claimed that the Yalunka Pass, which is 40 miles south of Krakow, was forced and aeroplanes destroyed on Polish aerodromes. The Warsaw radio station claimed at midday that about 100 German tanks had been put out of action near Falun, 50 miles southwest of Lodz, and that 34 German aeroplanes have been brought down. Another report received via Paris speaks of 16 German tanks being disabled and 500 prisoners taken. Herr Hitler today replied to President Roosevelt's appeal about the bombing of civilians and said he had already given his aircraft orders to bomb only military objectives. The German news agency has protested against allegations that the Germans have been using gas and incendiary bombs. Martial law has been proclaimed in Poland and evacuation measures are being taken in Warsaw. The Slovak minister in Warsaw has protested against the invasion of Slovakia by Germany, according to the official Polish news agency, and its use as a war base against Poland. Here in London, Mr. Chamberlain called a meeting of the cabinet at number 10 Downing Street and the Polish ambassador was present. It is reported that the British cabinet has already been widened and that four new ministers will be appointed. But it was learned definitely this afternoon that the Labour Party has decided not to be represented in the government, though it will give it its full support.
The House of Commons today gave a second reading to two bills. One is the National Service Bill, which will make all men between 18 and 41 subject to military service. The Secretary for War explained that it did not follow that the government would begin by conscripting men at the age of 18. Everything, he said, depended on how long a struggle might last. The other bill provides for grants to be paid in respect of injury or death caused among civilians by air raids or other war operations. The King and Queen have decided to stay at Buckingham Palace for the time being. This afternoon, the Queen drove from the palace to visit the Westminster ARP headquarters. The Ministry of Supply has made orders for the control of essential materials such as iron and steel, other metals, wool, flax and paper. The Ministry of Agriculture has arranged to supply the needs of farmers for tractors, fertilizers and other necessaries. In most cases, it is stated, the government have already accumulated reserves. It is thought that there are ample supplies of seeds for future requirements. The evacuation of London and other large towns continued today and reports from all over the country show that the scheme is working smoothly. Parents will be informed on Monday of the exact addresses to which their children have been taken. Members of the Metropolitan Police War Reserve who have been called up reported for duty today. There is now a reserve of nearly 20,000 men for police duties. The Portuguese government announced today that Portugal meant to remain neutral. An official manifesto declared that grave consequences might be expected from the war among the peoples of the whole world. Happily, it continues, our obligations in alliance with England, which we wish to confirm on this grave occasion, do not impose on us the necessity of abandoning our position of neutrality. The Hungarian government is withholding any declaration of neutrality as it does not recognize that the state of war exists. The Egyptian government is imposing a telephonic, telegraphic, postal and internal censorship. Now here is today's news from the Empire. The Canadian Prime Minister has sent a loyal message to Mr. Chamberlain telling him that the government of Canada will seek parliamentary authority to cooperate at the side of Britain. Mr. Chamberlain has replied that the British government are greatly encouraged to know that Canada is at one with them in resisting aggression. The South African Parliament had a special session today and General Herzog announced that he would soon make a statement on the government's attitude towards war. General Smuts introduced an emergency bill in the Senate to allow the new Senate to be constituted while the old one still existed. In Australia, the federal cabinet has declared that the danger of war exists. This means that power has been given to take action preparatory to proclaiming that a state of war exists when the full emergency plans would come into operation. The acting Prime Minister of New Zealand has promised full cooperation with this country. In India, the Viceroy has invited Mr. Gandhi and other political leaders to discuss the situation. Eighteen more Indian princes have sent assurances of loyalty to the King and offers of support. Here is a later report from the House of Commons. The Prime Minister made a short reply to Mr. Greenwood's speech. He said he shared the disgust expressed by the House at manoeuvres of the kind that were going on. The government, he added, was in a somewhat difficult position since it was difficult to synchronize action with allies by telephone. He said he felt certain he would be able to make a statement tomorrow. The House adjourned till midday tomorrow. You will hear next our news bulletin in English. Today, the French Parliament held a reunion. The two chambers heard a message from their president and Monsieur Lebrun, president of the French Republic, made a declaration. 
Besides, the Prime Minister, Monsieur Daladier, delivered the coming address of the Congress while Monsieur Camille Chauvin, Vice Prime Minister, raised a message to the Senate. The two assemblers decided to make their union the Union Sacred because of international attention and especially of a German attack towards Poland. And it was worth remarking every party, every congressman was having a single toad wrong. And the whole assembly held the strongest word President Daladier said in the name of the whole country. But let's take a look at President Brown's speech at first. Gentlemen, you are governed under a critical moment of our national life. War bursts out in Central Europe. Men are killing each other. Innocent victims are falling under aerial shooting. How did we get there? Two people had a dispute. They couldn't come to any solution. They could have come to some solution by means of free and fair negotiation, as the word goes from practically everywhere. On the very moment the diplomats were going to get together, Germany most brutally attacked Poland, and it would be quite hard indeed to justify such a war declaration. England and France, who are absolutely decided to stick to their prudent, wise, and moderate policy, did their best in order to avoid such a crime. And the voice of their leaders, John the Iron, of the highest moral and political authorities in the world, in order to see those who are responsible of war or peace think before starting in that horrible catastrophe. But it was no use. And unless we still want to listen to the voice of universal consciousness, what is talking to them, the worst events are getting ready. From so the necessary disposition, her security and the respect of her engagement made necessary. And she did take these measures in a perfect order, a great calm, and an absurd resolution. Young men have been watching the frontiers for a few days already. Today, the general mobilization is calling every force in order to defend the mother country. And in the name of the whole country, I send our army, our navy, and our aviation the most cordial salute and the expression of the unanimous trust of the country. As to the population, they also accomplish their duty. Citizens are more united than ever. And that union was continuously made once more. They have got strong minds animated with discipline and hope. They understand, besides the country's destiny, it is the whole world's destiny, liberty, and the future of civilization which are the next. And they will know how to raise their soul to the head of the greatest resolution. Let's get united and they will proud. As to President Daladier, 
had namely declared, Yesterday, the government decided general mobilization was to be made. The whole nation is answering their appeal with grave and resolute call. Young men join their regiment. They are actually covering our borders. The example of courage and dignity they have just given they could have got to dominate this debate. But they forgot the national thinking of national fraternity, everything which could decide them yesterday. They do not want anything anymore but serving France. And Want to send them the thankful salad of the nation, let's swear we shall be worth their attitude. The government has just put from other the conditions of acting according to her vital interests and our national honor. And now they've got to show you the facts in their whole importance as frankly and as clearly as possible. Peace has been already in danger for a few days. The German exigences towards Poland could have easily provoked the conflict. I will show you in a moment how the whole world's forces were coordinated during these last days in order to save peace. But, as we could have got some hope left, just when all of these efforts were going to get to success, suddenly Germany destroyed every one of them. During the 31st of August, the crisis got to its top, but Germany finally let England know she was accepting a direct negotiation with Poland. That country immediately tried to use that peaceful method in spite of the terrible threaten the German armies were representing for her since they had invaded Slovakia. But Germany ended with every negotiation in her silver Adolf Hitler ordered for the attack. Then Monsieur Daladier de Cœur. The head of Christendom had raised the very voice of reason and fraternity. President Roosevelt had sent an emotional message and suggested a general conference. The neutral states had also been very busy offering their mediation. Do I need to declare every one of these attempts met the best and immediate welcome from the French government. I am also very glad to give homage to the noble effort the Italian government had made. Even yesterday, we tried to realize the union of every goodwill in order to stop the hostility, at least, and obtain more peaceful methods to be used. and substituted to balance. But these efforts were not quite successful up to this moment. Anyway, they showed the responsibilities Germany was assuming. They assured Poland, the victim, the real help and the moral solidarity of free men and free nations. What we did before the beginning of the fight, we're ready to do it again, if the conciliating offer is made. We're ready to face it and join it once more. If the fight should stop, if the aggressors went back to their frontiers, if the free negotiation could be started, you may be sure, gentlemen, the French government would not spare the least effort in 
order to come to a success in the interest of the world peace. But time is getting short. France and England couldn't possibly accept the destruction of a friendly state, since it would mean nothing but violent enterprises would be started again themselves. In fact, it is but a German-Polish conflict known these gentlemen. It is but a new phase of the Hitlerian dictatorship evolution towards European and world domination. And Monsieur Daladier adds, there is no question of any matter of honor, but only saving peace or liberty in our security. The French people do not hate any other country in this world. And I am not going to praise war under these tragic circumstances. I only wish to do my duty just like an honest man. Every Frenchman who actually is getting back to his regiment is very peaceful, but also resolute to make any sacrifice. He feels in his very heart it is the whole French life which is menaced. You know, we wouldn't mobilize France to throw her against a foreign country. The French people certainly wouldn't invade a small country. Then, Monsieur Daladier gives the colony and protectorate, which answered the metropolis appeal, the talus of France. He also thanks foreigners were enlisting by millions. And Monsieur Daladier ended. We shall go until the very last means of negotiation. But we shall not hesitate in using force if force is necessary. Gentlemen, today it is France who command. In 1900, Mr. Chamberlain made the following declaration in the House of Commons. Last night, Sir Neville Henderson got an audience from her von Ribbentrop at half past nine and gave him the message we read you yesterday. The German foreign minister answered it had to present the Führer that communication and the ambassador declared he was ready to wait for her Hitler's answer. It is possible the delay is due to the fact they are actually looking, maybe, at the Italian proposition declaring the hostility should be stopped and an immediate conference be held between Great Britain, France, Poland, Germany, and Italy. His Majesty's government is really appreciating the efforts the Italian government has just made. Still, it thinks, as far as it is concerned, it is impossible to join such a meeting as long as Poland will be invaded, her cities bombed and densely ruled by a single part. And Mr. Chamberlain concluded, his Majesty's government doesn't admit neither the reason the German authorities are giving in order to justify their action, nor the validity of that very action, nor the efforts the German government gave about it. According to a Polish communique, they declare Aerial flights are going on. The German aviation is continuing with its action on the whole territory without any care for the military importance of its attack. On September the 3rd, Warsaw and its surroundings were attacked several times. And the loss are particularly interesting the civilian population. These two laws there, the enemy lost 
37 airplanes and schools 12. A strong military pressure is made on the Fort Howard front in Silesia and in the direction of Peshtoha. We destroyed a hundred tons. Fights are also going on in Pomerania and East Prussia and also in the region of Guinea. And this, ladies and gentlemen, ends our news bulletin in English. With the second coming of day number two of the Paris General Staff, on September the 2nd, the enemy air force continued its activity over our entire territory. Many localities were bombed regardless of whether they had any military importance. Yesterday, September the 1st, Warsaw was the aim of several air raids during which outlying districts of the capital and suburban settlements were being bombed. Hitherto, the activities of the German Air Force had caused casualties, mainly among civilians. Yesterday and today, we have shot down a total of 37 German airplanes. Our losses in those two days have been very terrible. On land, the enemy continues a strong attack on the Postale region, north of the High Tatra Mountains, on Silesia, and in the direction of St. Sakhova, northeast of Silesia. In the course of yesterday, we have destroyed about a hundred German tanks. On the Pomeranian and the East Prussian front, the fighting goes on in the frontier region. In the neighborhood of Gdynia, the Polish people, fighting continues. This is a plateau, the Polish munition base at the mouth of Dancy Harbor keeps up its defense. The following official community was published in the late evening hours. At night on September the 1st, the German government presented to the Polish government through the Dutch minister in Warsaw a suggestion to limit the air bombing in this war to the military objectives only. The suggestion was accepted by the Polish government. Nevertheless, in the course of today, the German air forces bombed the following open towns, which they did in chronologic order according to official reports. Lublin, Radom, Kodruzon, Radom, Tomatos, Marvedes, King, Bidros, Soren, Wutzko, a well-known host resort, Katanus, Torres, Yenis, Tarnobis, Kertus, Brodno, Poznan, Helmino, Kutno, Alexandrus, Dunchavola, Krasis, Wasp, Sotskuk, Wood, Vendita, and Sohova, Warsaw, seven times. Some of the above mentioned towns were bombed several times today, as for instance, Storin, Radom, Bigdos, Gruden, Yenis. In Torin, among others, an orphanage was formed. Besides the open town, also numerous villages, manor houses, and settlements were bombed, and even single individuals working on land or peasants riding in their carts were machine guns on the road. The bombing of open towns and settlements resulted in many casualties. The total number of the dead and wounded in Poland during yesterday and today amounted to about 1,500, of whom women and children constituted a large percentage. As we said above, in the course of yesterday and today, Warsaw was attacked many times. In the course of September the 1st, that means yesterday, German bombers had raided raid Warsaw seven times at roughly two-hour intervals, starting early in the morning. About 120 bombs were dropped, mainly of the shattering kind. More intensive bombing was reported from the outskirts of the capital and from suburban localities. In Warsaw, there were 10 people killed and 25 wounded. In the suburban area, the number of wounded is very considerable and the percentage of severe cases is high. Today, since 8 o'clock a.m., there were seven air attacks on Warsaw. The Dutch, or shall we say the latest, 
took place at 8.10. At Kiev, at Lublin, 30 people were killed and 58 wounded, including five children. Four houses were destroyed. All of the casualties are among the civilians. In the late hours of the evening, news came that Transkhova, the Polish earliest town, is on fire. The famous shrine of the Holy Mary, the holiest of holies of Poland, worshipped by all Poles and esteemed by all other religions, by all Catholic Poles and esteemed by all other religions, is in danger. This is one more example of the brutality of the German attack on Poland. In Warsaw, the atmosphere of complete calm prevails again today, in spite of the seriousness of the situation. It might even be said that the Polish capital seems to be getting used to air raids and does not seem too much impressed when the factory has compelled them to find the refuge in the gates and staircases of the nearest party. There, in every house, a number of women and young boys performing anti air raid precautions services maintain order. The boys, some of them in shouting uniforms, seem very excited and during the air raid go out of the courtyard, watching the trains which appear on very great heights and discussing the technicalities of the flying combat. It should be added that the Germans had never succeeded in getting there out of the center of the city to infect the fleet at very great heights by the Polish anti-aircraft artillery and fighter planes. Being unable to do any bombing on the main objectives, the enemy dropped bombs on suburbs and suburban areas, particularly suffered Oxford at the Bourbon resort of the Bacchelar Sanatorium. On the phone, the night in warfare is going on quite normally. All theaters and cinemas stay open, having begun their autumn season as usual. Newspapers, which are printed on slightly fewer pages than usual, owing to the fact that much of their staff was conscripted, publish large half page advertisements of new films shown in the capital. The only difference noticeable during the interval between the air raids and the Sarente is the smaller number of taxis and other vehicles on the street, as many of their drivers were conscripted. Women seem to prevail among the people in the street. Finally, many people are carrying gas masks. That Hitler's promise not to use poison gas did not seem to fill them with complete trust, as most of the staff prepared airtight rooms where also two weeks' provisions are being kept in case of any impediments in transport and food supplies of the city. At present, no sort of food stuff whatever is sent. Prices are kept at the level everywhere after the strong measures taken by the government against all those who betrayed an inclination towards profit sharing during the first days after the defense preparations were increased. The general atmosphere is that of a firm resolve to go through this experience when such necessity arose, no matter how long it would take. The general opinion repeated everywhere in the papers and by the people in the streets, in cafes and in private parties is that odds are against Germany in this war, much more so than they were in the last war. Today, the other Polish citizens declaring their loyalty and decision to fight the invader, also the citizens of Jewish race were joined. The executive of the Polish rabbis, Union, appeals to all the citizens of Jewish race to give their lives and property in defense of the country. The Association of Rabbis with University Education issued also an appeal to the Jewish community, declaring as an organization of the spiritual leaders of the Jewry in Poland, that this country did not want war, nor was the country of her outbreak, of its outbreak. Poland, with unprecedented patience, tolerated the persecution of Polish minority in the Third Reich and the persecution of the Poles in Danzig. Now she has been forced to accept the war, not only for her independence and security, but also for the sake of all those countries in which liberty, based on law and justice, is the supreme good. The Polish Jews consider it as their duty to join the ranks of the defenders of the Polish state as its citizens. The Jews in Poland, such 
that the heroic self-defense of Stalin shall result in the victory of all those people of Europe which love freedom and in the triumph of law, justice, and peaceful collaboration of nations. In this struggle, they will certainly be helped by God. The appeal of the two supreme representations of the Jewish community in Poland proves that in the struggle within Keda, there is no citizen in Poland who would not understand the duty for the country. They all, without any exception, answer the appeal of the president so that their national honor required and their attachment to the Polish state. The Polish Parliament met today at 3 p.m. and the importance of the moment was extended by the air raid of German bombers which began at the moment when the Prime Minister spoke. The Premier stated that the situation is clear. We have been attacked and we fight, he said. We all know the events which preceded the outbreak of this war which has been forced upon us. The Prime Minister put the government at the disposal of the Commander-in-Chief. Also, two representatives of the Ukraine and the minority in the Parliament declared their full solidarity with the point of view of Poland, as well as full support with the cause. From you, parliamentary representatives of Polish nations, we expect only to understand that the idea of Polish-Ukrainian brotherhood lives. We so consider the representatives of the Ukrainian minority, Mr. Stitcher. With this news, we conclude our daily bulletin in English. It is entirely up to the decisions of Britain and France if peace is to prevail in Europe or not. This is the tenor of commentaries published by the German press in the, its editions on Saturday evening. Britain only will be responsible for the hamburger Framdenblatt, for instance, declares, if the present crisis is to develop into a general conflict. The paper emphatically denies the theory which holds that Germany is the aggressor in the present conflict with Poland. Mr. Chamberlain, the paper continues to say, refers to view the advance of the German troops as an aggressive action which menaces the independence of Poland. But such arguments can be set forth only if he actually intends to set the Anglo-Polish pact into operation. For the sake of history, however, the fact must be nailed down that the numerous border incidents in Silesia and East Prussia, and especially the Polish bombardment of Boyton, created a situation which made it incompatible with the honor of the great power to let that series of military transgressions go by unpunished. Germany's action is an act of defense. Reports spread by the English News Service Exchange Telegraph and by the broadcasting station of Posen, Poland, are being emphatically denied in by Berlin. These reports asserted that German airplanes had dropped gas and incendiary bombs in the vicinity of Posen. The German official news agency, Deutsches Nachrichtenbüro, has been empowered to make the following statement. In the wake of false political reports with a tendency to cause alarm, this is the first atrocity story in the military field. It should be pointed out most emphatically that the disseminators of such atrocity stories are taking upon themselves grave responsibility. In view of the Führer's statement before the Reichstag to the effect that the German Air Force received orders to attack military objectives only, provided that the opponent keeps to the same rule, this piece of atrocity reporting has become a dangerous game. The warning against inventing such atrocity tales, the Deutsches Nachrichtenbüro goes on to say, can therefore not be emphatical enough. Such atrocity stories were permitted to go through by another Germany, but not by this one. The Germany's currency and financial situation was a subject dealt with at a meeting of the directors of the German Reichsbank, which convened on Saturday by Reich Minister Fung, who holds the post of President of the Reichsbank presiding. The German Minister of Economics pointed out that not the slightest tendency of nervousness had become noticeable in the German banking and financing system, very much in contrast to such tendencies prevailing in foreign countries. 
The German exchanges, the minister emphasized, are operating properly and exhibit a confident attitude. The German Reichsbank had therefore no reason for issuing decrees of any kind which might be necessary for the protection of the currency and the monetary and credit system. All German girls aged between 17 and 25 years, a proclamation by the leader of the Reich Labour Service, read, are being called upon to do honorary service with the Labour Service for women. Exempted from the call are only those girls who hold positions of special importance. Prime Minister Stauning of Denmark, assisted by the Danish Foreign Minister Dr. Munch, had a conversation on Saturday with the envoy plenipotentiary of the German government, Ambassador von Hassel. The German envoy expressed the German government's keen desire to maintain economic relations with Denmark on the same basis which has been operation up to now. The Danish Prime Minister expressed his gratitude for this declaration and stated that the Danish government were anxious to observe strict neutrality is animated by the same desire. The Warsaw newspaper Express Perane stated on Saturday that Poland never really thought of entering into negotiations with Germany. For <laughs> Germany, so that paper holds, is no nation with which to sit down for negotiations. Germany is not worthy of being treated as an equal partner in international dealings. In a similar vein, the Polish newspaper Polska Zbrojna, which is close to military circles, rejects the German proposal. Poland's arms, this military organ states, will reply to the latest German offer. In commenting upon the European situation, the Italian press in its Saturday editions points out with emphasis that Adolf Hitler wants to localize the conflict between Germany and Poland. In his speech before the Reichstag, the Führer again announced his decision to refrain from any aggressive action against France or Britain. Only by the initiative of those two powers, the semi-official Giornale d'Italia states, will the Polish conflict develop into a general European conflagration. Italy has done everything in her power to avoid that conflict. For fully five months, Germany permitted the Polish problem to be debated upon frankly, and she has left all doors open for negotiations. Italy, this influential Roman newspaper assures its readers, will continue to watch the events with the utmost political and diplomatic vigilance. King Emperor Victor Emmanuel of Italy returned to Rome from his summer residence, San Rossore, on Saturday. He received Signor Mussolini, who gave him a detailed account of the general situation. War fear is spreading even to the zoo in London. The administration of the zoological garden had all poisonous snakes and other dangerous animals killed on Saturday. The elephants were shipped away. Beginning on Saturday, all theatres and vaudeville shows in Paris will be closed. Numerous cinemas was forced to cancel their performances for lack of personnel. It is believed that all places of amusement will be closed down in Paris. The Paris newspapers will from now on appear in editions of not more than four printed pages. Silver coins valued to 10 and 20 francs and nickel coins valued at 5 francs are we withdrawn from general circulation in France a decree published on Saturday stipulates. The Bank of France has been empowered to issue instead notes to the amounts of 5, 10 and 20 francs. A state of siege has been declared for the whole of Egypt on Saturday. Prime Minister Ali Maher has been entrusted with special powers to safeguard public security. Prime Minister de Valera of Ireland read a statement before the Irish Parliament on Saturday in which he declared that the Irish government is firmly determined to remain neutral. At the same time, the government announced the immediate mobilization of the Irish armed forces. The total strength of the Irish army is approximately 25,000 men. Soviet Russia's newly appointed ambassador to Berlin, Alexander Skvartsev, arrived at the Berlin aerodrome on Saturday afternoon by a special plane which had been sent to call for him at Stockholm. He was accompanied by Monsieur Vladimir Perkov, 
the newly appointed secretary to the Soviet Russian Embassy, General Maxim Purkayev, Minister Plenipotentiary for Military Affairs of the Soviet Union, arrived by the same plane with his staff. The officers accompanying General Purkayev are Brigadier General Mikhail Belyakov, Colonel Nikolai Skolonyakov, Major Ivan Bashanov, and Captain Alexander Sedich. The Soviet Russian ambassador and General Purkayev were met by leading officials of the German Foreign Office and high-ranking officers of the German Armed Force. As announced Saturday in Berlin, the German Navy has provided for the security of the Baltic Sea to such an extent that it has been possible to allow free fishing rights in the Baltic. <coughs> the commander of the German Armed Forces made the following announcement Saturday evening. The German troops have been advancing successfully along all frontiers. The army detachments operating south of the industrial district of Upper Silesia is approaching the town of Vyala and occupied the town of Ples. North of those points, the German troops advanced past the line of Polish dugouts. In the territory north of the Upper Silesian industrial area, our troops are approaching the river Marte. Armored de detachments are advancing upon the town of Radomsko, north of the town of Tenstochow. The town of Vialu has been occupied. Rapid advances have, are being made upon the town of Sierac by the troops operating along the line past the town of Kempen. The river of Brahe has been crossed by the German troops operating out of Pomerania and succeeded in reaching the river Vistula at a point southwest of the town of Graudens in a forceful land. Thus, the German army corps advancing from East Prussia via the town of Graudens has practically succeeded in uniting with the German forces advancing from Pomerania. The Polish army detachments stationed in the northern parts of the corridor section have thus been cut off. They are being mopped up by the German forces in encounters in the section which is known as Tuchel Heath. Other German troop contingents advancing from East Prussia in a southerly direction gained ground. The German troops are advancing upon the town of Pratic. The German Air Force dealt heavy blows to military objectives in Poland by lightning like actions. Numerous Polish airplanes were destroyed in aerial encounters. A great number of military aerodromes were attacked from the ground, especially in the vicinity of the following towns. Gdynia, Krakow, Lodz, Radom, Demblin, brest Lublin, Lak, Gotha, Warsaw, Okechi, Posen, Levicza. The aeroplanes stationed in the hangars and upon the flying fields went up in flames. Furthermore, railway track lines were destroyed and military transports were derailed. Marching columns of the Polish army, which we are retreating, were bombed. An ammunition plant near Skarczysko, Kamiena, exploded after an attack. It is believed that the Polish Air Force has been badly hurt by the successes established today. The German Air Force reigns unrestrictedly above Poland and is now available for other tasks of the protection of the German Rust. Detachments of the German Navy operating in the Bay of Danzig opened fire upon the fortifications and the war port of Hela on Friday afternoon. Air squadrons of the German Navy bombed the war port of Virginia several times during the day. This is Germany calling. You have just been listening to our regular news service. Now we now should like to stand by for a special announcement. Further news. He received Senor Mussolini who gave him a detailed account of a general situation. It is reported from Lisbon that the Portuguese government today announced its neutrality declaration. The Portuguese government, in an appeal to the nation, points out that the alliance with Britain does not compel Portugal to abandon her neutral position. Portugal is resolved to remain neutral. The Warsaw newspaper Express Korane stated on Saturday that Poland never really thought of entering into negotiations with Germany. For Germany, so that paper holds, 
is no nation with which to sit down for negotiations. Germany is not worthy of being treated as an equal partner in international dealings. In a similar vein, the Polish newspaper Polska Spojna, which is close to military circles, rejects the German proposals. Poland's arms, this military organ states, will reply to the latest German offer. The Polish radio reports on a decree of the Polish government forbidding all credit institutes in Poland to pay out any credits for a period of seven days. There will be no transactions in the Polish credit system during this period. The Prime Minister Stalning of Denmark, assisted by the Danish Foreign Minister, Dr. Munch, had a conversation on Saturday with the envoy plenipotentiary of the German government, Ambassador Kinhasa. The German envoy expressed the German government's keen desire to maintain economic relations with Denmark on the same basis which has been in operation up to now. The Danish Prime Minister expressed his gratitude for this declaration and stated that the Danish government, anxious to observe strict neutrality, is animated by the same desire. The Führer and Commander-in-Chief of the German Defense Forces has renewed the Order of the Iron Cross in commemoration of the heroic battles which Germany's sons have fought in former wars and in view of the present fight in defense of the homeland. The Iron Cross will be awarded exclusively for special bravery in the face of the enemy and for the distinguished service and troop leadership in four classes. In addition to the Iron Cross, first and second class, and the Great Iron Cross, the awarding of which the Führer has retained for himself, a new cross called the Ritterkreuz is also to be awarded. The award of all classes is to be made without discrimination of rank. In the event that the candidate already possesses an iron cross awarded him during the World War, he is to receive instead a silver bar medallion. The first news bulletin of the German Shortwave Station's behind has been concluded.